Welcome. Uh, hello, members of council and uh, staff and public, uh, and welcome to the special committee meeting, uh, special meeting of Committee of the Whole. Uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that Wolfville is situated in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And as such, I ask that we conduct our business with the seven sacred teachings in mind, truth, honesty, love, courage, respect, wisdom, and humility. And this is a one item agenda. Could I have a motion please to approve the agenda as received? Councillor Elliott and seconded by Councillor Butler. Uh, all in favor? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, we do have one addition at, at the end of council. We will go in camera briefly. Uh, so that's just members of council. Thank you, CAO. Uh, now, all in favor of approval of the agenda with that addition, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And uh, we don't have minutes, of course, because this is a, a special meeting, but we do have uh, four people for public input. I understand we have two people in person and two people who will be coming in on uh, via Zoom. And just for those, some, some of the people uh, in person and uh, certainly via Zoom are used to this, but we do have a, a person that's not a regular. So just a reminder, each individual, uh, you'll come up to the, uh, to the podium in front of me, you are being recorded uh, and this is on Facebook Live. You will have three minutes to make your point. This is not a question and answer period. Uh, it's just uh, an opportunity for you to make your, your points um, and uh, comments related to personnel, current or potential litigation issues or planning issues for which a public hearing has already occurred but no decision has been made will not be answered. And generally, it's not, as I mentioned, it's not a Q&A. So. so with that, uh, Janet McLeod, would you like to come up? And I will, once you start, I will be timing and I'll kind of give you a, a hand. When one minute warning. Uh, one minute warning, okay. okay. All right, go, go ahead. And if you'd introduce what? yourself. Jeez, I don't know. Yes. Nobody ever has a hard time hearing me, yes. trust well, me. Well, it's recorded, so. Yeah. When you're ready, just give us your name and where you live. Thank you. Hi, my name is Janet McLeod. I live at 24 Wooden Avenue in Wolfville, and I've got two issues I'd like to raise. One of them is um, nobody can seem to find the covenants for Bigelow Street in regards to fencing and eyesore and whatever. So there's been a bit of a neighborhood dispute uh mostly with one person who i think anyway has some issues and um has called 911 a couple of times been ticketed for frivolous use of 911 most of us on the street have spent considerable money on our properties and um i think that the chicken wire fence is an eyesore so nobody can find the covenants um I, obviously um the compliance officer has been involved and they sort of pitched it back to the RCMP, who pitched it back to the compliance officer. So anyway, that's my one issue. I noticed that there was something in the bylaws about an ice unsafe or unsightly. So I don't know if that qualifies. Uh, compliance doesn't seem to be uh, doing anything about it. And um, so I'm just wondering if I could get some feedback at some point about how to address this issue. I'm sure the RCMP has better things to do in Wolfville than to litigate or mediate a neighbor dispute. Um, but it's getting kind of contentious, quite contentious. Um, the other issue I would like to raise as you know, driving in Wolfville, a lot of people like to drive 15 kilometers an hour down Main Street. And I know that this has been brought up before, but I really think that there needs to be a light at Gasparo and Main Street. And, uh, you know, people don't seem to know what to do. There's a lot of pedestrians at that intersection. People tend to stop when um, someone is eight feet from the intersection if they don't even know which way they're crossing the street. And then if somebody misses their turn, nobody seems to know what to do. So I really think there needs to be a pedestrian, you know, walk, don't walk, as well as uh, traffic lights for the traffic, the wheel, the wheel traffic. And uh, I was heard, I don't know if this is 
accurate, but that it would cost $200,000 to put a light in. And uh, I don't know, maybe you should get some more bids. I don't know much about electricians and electrical stuff, but I can't see that it would cost that exorbitant amount. And that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, on your first issue, uh, the compliance officer is dealing with you, and certainly they will can follow up and uh, uh, planning may be able to find some covenants. I, I, I... Nobody, I've already okay. To okay. Um, and the other, that's a budget item, and uh, I believe uh, the issue of a light is going to come up, if not around this council table, then within the, within the next number of years uh, with respect to some of the other development happening in the town. So, but it is certainly on our radar. Thank you. Uh, Noel. Hi, uh, Noel McQueen to Fairfield Street. I'm under the impression this special meeting is about the MOU. Correct. It's fair. Uh, so I'd just like to mention a few things that some of the residents have mentioned to me they would like to have considered in the negotiations, the MOU, and I realize that we are at the beginning of this process, so these are simply ideas. Um, so uh, there's a few elements that some residents would like to see added to the MOU. Um, so some residents may want to hold Acadia a little more responsible than they currently are for disruptive off-campus student behaviors by speaking to the need for more and better student residences on campus. Uh, the need for an official record of off-campus student addresses. The need for Acadia to allow for residents to submit concerns about off, uh, student off-campus behaviors to uh, Acadia administration through an official student code of conduct forum and the need for Acadia to recognize its responsibility to help generate a greater set of socially responsible values in the small portion of the student population that consistently demonstrates entitled behaviors in town with impunity. All done, of course, with the assistance and support of the town and permanent residents. Yes, we don't expect anybody to be able to do this on their own. On a completely separate issue uh, with regards to pool use, the current MOU states, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, that it will provide that Acadia will provide residents of Wolfville with equal access and opportunity to its recreation facilities that it provides to its students. It has been the observation and experience of several regular pool users that Acadia has experienced difficulty in maintaining a regular schedule of pool programming that meets the needs of citizens of Wolfville who use it on a regular basis to help them with physiotherapy needs, health requirements, and socialization opportunities. I would like to submit to you the radical idea that perhaps included in the negotiation of the new MOU could be the idea of an Acadia Wolfville collaborative co-management of the Acadia pool to help ensure regular pool programs that meet the needs of Acadia students and Wolfville residents moving forward. That's all I have for you. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, was, I didn't even get to the one minute. So. <laughs> um, Mike, I think we have two, um, uh, Mr. Lonis and Bob Lutz uh, on uh, waiting in the wings on Zoom. We do. Uh, I just, do they want to speak? Uh, raise your oh. hand, I guess. Use the raise hand function, uh, Bob or George, if you'd like to speak. I don't want to elevate anybody if they're not expecting it. Yep, there we go. Bob's up. Bob's up. Lutz. They're not there yet. That's council that you see. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Um, All right. Bob, go ahead. All right, thank you, Wendy. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, I would say in the in the MOU, whatever the negotiators believe would be helpful to the town to have Acadia take more responsibility for off-campus students would be appropriate. The recent uh, email response I got from the university <clears throat> on one of the questions raised by Noel was that uh, there was no business case for having off-campus student addresses. So if Acadia's only concern is their 
their business, then I think the town needs to take a sharp look at how to change that attitude. Um, so that's a general statement of uh, the fact that Acadia needs to be part of the community. And they are to some extent. The second point is this. <clears throat> I heard Dr. Ricketts on numerous occasions talk about the benefit and how uh, wonderful it was to have signed the MOU, yet I would argue uh, Acadia did not live up to their uh, commitments under the MOU. And I would challenge council uh, in that no one said anything about it. It was uh, like a, uh, it's almost like a, an indigenous treaty. It was about friendship. And uh, so I would say going forward, when the new MOU is signed, if Acadia is not living up to their commitments, as I would say they have not in the past, then someone should say so. That's it. Thank you so much, Bob. And uh, George Lonis, I believe, is also going to speak. Hi, George. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, number one, I would fully endorse the presentation of Noelle McQueen this evening. I support her suggestions 100%. I would also support 100% the uh, comments of our friend uh, Bob Lutz. And I've just got a couple of points to, to, to raise. And number one, um, it's difficult to, I, I don't know what the purpose of this meeting is tonight, other than the fact that you've got the MOU on the agenda. I don't know if you're, you were thinking of having a wide open discussion um, by council. It's, it's a little awkward when you, we only have three people who really address the issue of the MOU and we each only have three minutes, maybe four minutes. Uh, that, that to my mind, just makes it very difficult. It would be helpful if you are, in, and I assume you are working your way through a revised MOU. At some point before this thing becomes final, it would be helpful to have a special meeting of whether it's committee whole or council and that members of the public again have a further opportunity because we, we're, we're not reacting to anything. It would be nice to have something to react to rather than uh, some of these issues that we have repeatedly brought to council over the full life of the MOU. We've made progress, there's no question about it. And I, and I would say that's largely progress on the town side, not on the side of the university. And I think with the recent hiring of the compliance officers, that's been a 100% improvement in, in having uh, those resources available to the town. Um, the MOU has to be looked at something other than, you, you, you could be a, a, a a bit of a rogue and say, well, the MOU is Acadia's piggy bank. And whenever they want a project, they come to the town and make a request, whether it's $80,000 for the, uh, the new football field or, or other things that have gone on in the past. We, the town makes these contributions to projects and the, the charging station is one that comes to mind, which I understand is jointly funded by the town and the university and receives significant federal money. That was completed in March, let's say of 2020, shortly after the uh, arrival of COVID. But it was until late August that, that the public were allowed to cross in about 40 to 50 feet of university land to use it. And that was done without- I ask any... you to start to wrap up, please. Okay, that was done without, this is my point about why it's very difficult to have this type of a discussion and look for public involvement. Anyway, it's things like that where the town is not involved in the decision-making process. I understand the town was not involved in the very first discussions about the CFL game, a very significant event for Woeful, but it was only after the CFL and Woeful were talking that the town was invited to come in on the discussions. And I, and I don't think that's very helpful. I think there, there has to be a, a better understanding that it is a three-way uh, program between the town the university and the Acadia Students Union. Um, in any event, th that's all I have to say this evening. I don't have time to say anything else. I have more to say, 
but I, I would really appreciate having a further opportunity when there's a draft available and that the public can have further input at that time. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Um, and I, I fully expect that council will expect that too. So thank you. Uh, and I would say that we are just at the very beginning of this process now. We might know a bit more as the evening progresses on how we are going to roll this out and, and revise it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, so uh, as has been mentioned a few times, the purpose of this meeting is to uh, for council to have their first opportunity to discuss the uh, uh, the current and revisions to the MOU and uh, staff are going to take it, us through that. Uh, CAO Bowden and uh, uh, Barb Smith and Kelton Thomason and uh, I see many other staff back there. I would also uh, uh, note that we do have the president, uh, uh, Sadie McAleer, uh, president of the ASU. Welcome, Sadie. And Ian Murray, uh, administrator with uh, Acadia in the, uh, the president's office. So uh, really appreciative that the two of you are here tonight to hear this discussion. Mayor Donovan, may I? Yes, you may. Thank you. Before we get on to the business of the MOU, um, after reviewing the recording of Committee of the Whole, I'd like to state for the record, as a result of my colleague, Councillor Butler's comments in the Committee of the Whole on September 6th, of having a big problem with those who come in and vote and leave, that once I realized I had several competing priorities that day that I contacted both the CAO and the Mayor to indicate that I would be able to attend piece by piece of the meeting, just give me a second, please but recognize that I couldn't, that it would have been disruptive. So I actually sought advice from you both and it was re recommended that I be here for what I could be here for. Yes. So I would just like that added to the record, please. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. I, I did express that uh, Councillor Proudfoot uh, to any councillors who contacted me that, that we had had that discussion and it is absolutely fine and glad that you did join us. Thank, thank you. you, my concern was publicly. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Sorry. All right, um, where was I? Welcome, Sadie. <laughs> Welcome, Ian. Thank you, staff, for working on this. And I am going to hand this over to our CAO. Thank you. Thank you. So this is intended to be very discussion-based and conversational. Um, to an earlier speaker's point, this is the very beginning of the process. It's intended for this to be an opportunity for council to give some feedback to staff on what you feel is working well, what could be improved. Um, the last slide that I, I won't pop up, but you'll see later does show next steps, which includes the development of a, a full consultation plan. So there'll be lots of opportunities along the way for folks to give feedback. This is the beginning, but we felt it was really important to have this conversation on the front end so we can understand what's important to council before the negotiations fully start. It's gonna be really important for the ASU and our Acadia partners to also have similar conversations amongst themselves. So we're all ready to come to the table. So the goals that we've outlined for today is just to go through the current MOU. Um, for those of you that don't live it every day, you may not be as familiar with it. So I think it's really important that everybody has a common understanding of what's in it and how it works to make sure that we have an opportunity for council to give that feedback, as I just mentioned, as we start this formal review process and to make sure that any expectations that you have can be conveyed through staff as we start the discussions. So was there any other goals that council could identify for tonight that you'd like to see come out of the discussions? And we may circle back at the end to make sure that we did meet your needs. You don't mean specific to the MO, just, just in general. In, in okay. general, yeah. Okay. So just to talk a little bit about the MOU. So the current MOU, which was the first one that was signed between the three parties was signed in October, 2018. So we had, you know, a little bit of time with it before COVID hit. Um, so we've been at it for four years. The MOU doesn't actually expire. It continues on indefinitely. So when March 31st hits of this year, we're not gonna lose the MOU. What it does say though, is that every four years we do a review. And if there's changes that need to be made, it does contemplate that the partners may have to go back and re-ratify it. So if there are significant changes, which I actually suspect there will be because this was our first sort of go at it and we've learned a lot along the way, it will go back to the three partners to ratify. 
So, um, and I, I think I've covered all of those slides. So just wanted to make that point because I think some folks assume that it expires every four years. It doesn't, it actually continues on. So the purpose of the MOU was really to bring the three parties together to look at how we can work together to achieve our mutual strategic goals. And I just wanna read a paragraph to you right out of the MOU and the purpose, because I think it captures well, at least what the thinking was back in 2018 around the purpose. So recognizing that we are stronger together than if working in isolation, the town Acadia and the ASU wish to transcend the traditional town and gown framework to deliver the most integrated university town model in Canada and to truly materialize on the goal of becoming a learning community. This partnership agreement foundation lays the foundation on how we will mobilize to ensure that we can best meet the needs of our community and respective institutions. So that was really the purpose that we were working off in 2018. So any comments on that before we move on? So there were four key principles that were in the document and uh, staff have had quite a few discussions on the principles and, and we've talked to some of the partners about the principles too. I think as we go into our discussions, at least from my view, sitting in this chair, I think the principles still do resonate. Um, there, there may be some tweaks that the parties would like to see. Whether we've lived up to the principles is a whole different conversation, but the principles in and of themselves, I think have stand, stood the test of time, um, at least from the perspective of those that have been working with the MOU sort of in the day to day. Um, but I just wanna share what those are. So the first one was Wolfville is only Wolfville with Acadia and Acadia is only Acadia with Wolfville. So the town and Acadia recognize that both entities are intertwined. Both entities will live up to their full potentials of success with the support and partnership of the other. I'll just go through these and then. So we must invest in each other through dedicated resources, funding and collaborative partnerships. The town and Acadia believe that greater benefit will be achieved if each invests in the other's success. We have a joint responsibility to commit to a high standard of community livability for all residents of Wolfville. All residents of Wolfville deserve to live in a town that is attractive, safe, and where neighbors respect each other. In instances where this becomes jeopardized, the town and Acadia will work together to address the issues promptly and collaboratively. And the final one is we have a joint responsibility to ensure the success of all Acadia students. Acadia students gain experience and knowledge not only through Acadia's academic programs and on-campus experiences, but by integrating as proud citizens of the town of Wolfville. Their involvement as residents of Wolfville should be enriching and should contribute to the overall positive experience students have at Acadia. So I just wanna pause here and see council's reaction to the principles, whether they resonate with you, whether you think, you know, at least at first glance, if there's some changes you'd like to see. Councilor Crabbett. Thank you. Uh, it's actually on the first slide, I think, Erin, just the use of the word alongside. So it says in a partnership between the two institutions alongside the ASU, I'm not sure alongside is the best word. So I'll, we, if we can just park that one, but that was my only reaction so far. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilor Ingham. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to go with this or whatever. So I just need to bring it up so we can, I mean, since this is the first that we're discussing this, um, I'm getting the feeling after you're reeling this, uh, reading this, Aaron, that the town doesn't feel like Acadia is an equal partner and that we, the town is doing more of, of the, the heavy lifting per se. So I, I don't, I don't want to get into blaming or you know, going down what we should do, what we shouldn't do, because this is sort of the start, but that's, as you were reading that, that's the feeling that I got from people that were speaking and the feedback that I've got is that in order for it to be a joint partnership and things to work, both, both parties need to come to the table equally along with the ASU, just to throw that out there. Councillor Elliott. Thank you. Um, I guess two and three kind of rattle me at this stage. Um, I don't see investment as being equal on both sides. Um, we contribute to sports fields and bursaries. And I know Queen's University gives money to the city of Kingston around uh, livability issues. And that's 
as far as I know, never been on the agenda. So to have a joint responsibility for both resources and high standard of community living, I think it's a big question mark. So the question is, and we're gonna get into whether we've done this well or not. Uh, so points noted, but as a principle that we are trying to achieve, does this make sense? If we were able to achieve these in partnership together, does that resonate with council? And again, I take your point, we're gonna talk about, I'm sure all the partners have some frustrations along the way, different parts of the MOU on how the implementation has gone, but are these, are these good principles to sort of hold close as we go through or do they not resonate? Council McKay had her light on. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to spin it back there. I could cut this thing apart with scissors and put, paste it back together in a way that I, I might like it better. But from when I read the key principles, I feel that um, it, it gives us something to shoot for. So I, those principles do resonate with me. I take the points though. I don't know why the ASU isn't in any of those key principles. Um, so I'm not sure if there's a way to fit them in or not, but I, I think that's something to consider. Uh, just before you go on, CAO, uh, I, I personally like these principles. I, I agree that we uh, maybe need to strengthen some of the wording to operationalize them. That's the correct term. Uh, but as, as principles, as something to aspire to, I, I think they are, for me, they are good. Anyone else before we go on? All right, CAO. And just to speak to one of those points, I think the reason the ASU is not reflected in a way that probably in this go around we would want is as we went through the initial go around, ASU originally wasn't intended to be a signatory. And as we got into the process, it was identified that that was really important. It was really important for the town. And so we made that change and they were pulled into the process and they became a signatory. But when you look at the way some of it was written, I don't think the language really caught up to the fact that they were added as a signatory later in the process. So that's noted. Just on that point, Erin, I think, and I, I went back to the front page to see where it says the names and it says here and after referred to as ASU. I think it is in this document that the ASU and the ASU president is an elected official. They represent the student body. So I think that that would provide some context around them being one of the partners. Other comments on that and again this isn't your only chance to talk about it but at least it's good to know that they resonate at least to start the process and we can certainly circle back to them so barb and kelt and i are going to kind of go through the shared goals and chat a little bit about what was intended under the six goals that are currently in the mou these were identified back in 2018 as being areas that we thought we could move the needle on together. They were important at the time. Some of them likely are still important now. Some of them maybe aren't as important. And as we'll get to later on, there's probably some things that are missing. Uh, they weren't ranked in any way. So the way they're listed in the MOU um, doesn't mean that one's more important than the other because it's listed first. They're just all sort of on equal footing in terms of their level of importance. So if we did decide we wanted to rank um, the priorities or the shared goals, that would be something different. So just keep that in mind. And maybe I'll get Barb to come up and, and we'll start with communications and we'll just kind of go through them one at a time. And part of it will be just to explain what we were trying to achieve under each goal. And from the staff perspective, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the things that um, I think we've probably done well in each area and some of the areas where there's some deficiencies. So I have circulated around um, and we can make sure that anybody that's interested does get a copy. There was a presentation that was done to Town and Gown in November of 2021 that was almost like a report card. It went through all the different areas. It talked about some of the successes and challenges. And then it also identified a whole list of things we've done together that don't neatly fit one of those six bucket areas. So that is a, a helpful guide. It's a little bit dated. Um, it was based on a presentation that had been done to Committee of the Whole actually the previous May, um, but it's still quite helpful. There's, there's been obviously some work done over the past year, but it's a good reference document to kind of understand um, what's worked well and, and maybe what hasn't. 
So just to remind folks, and then I, I will get Barb to weigh in, the communications goal was really to help aim improve communications between the two institutions. Because back in 2018, we felt that superficially, we had that good relationship. But there were a lot of missed opportunities where we weren't working together on communication initiatives. And you'll see in the MOU, there were some very specific deliverables that were identified that we wanted to achieve. But overall, the biggest goal was that the parties would communicate openly and frequently with each other, with students of Acadia, with permanent residents of the town, and with other key stakeholders. And then there's a list of things. So as Barb has been our communications guru for the town and has been working on this file with both the ASU and Acadia, I'm going to turn it over to her to give her thoughts, and we can circle back on some of the specifics that we've achieved. Thank you, Erin, and through Mayor Donovan to members of council and staff and our visitors here in the gallery and those watching at home. Um, this is a great opportunity for me to share some insights on how we do communicate uh, very effectively with the members who are listed in the MOU. So without a doubt, there will always be areas for improvement. But from my perspective, and still being fairly new with the town of Wolfville, um, arriving at the town in the midst of the COVID pandemic, I was really impressed with the ease of communication that we had with some very significant partners. That is not always the case. Um, so for the most part, we have very open communications with the Office of the President. So Ian Murray is here tonight, and Ian is somebody that we're in touch with often. Uh, it's also been a real pleasure to work with Sadie and her role and even through transitions last year on the ASU, Sadie has always really stepped up to be available to answer questions and help, helping to share those messages. So the operational reality for us is that these open lines of communication mean that we can do our jobs better here within the town. So this allows us to problem solve. For example, uh, we went through this last year when we were coming up on messaging for the overnight, overnight parking ban. We were able to connect with our partners and secure access for town residents to get parking permits on the Acadia campus. That dialogue, that open communication solved a problem and we're looking forward to maybe doing that again this year. <laughs> Just a little plug there. Um, we've also worked on communications during COVID. So a year ago at this time, we were messaging around vaccine requirements and mask mandates and all of those things. And to be able to do that, understanding what a major partner and a major segment of our community was also doing without having to fight for that access made life so much easier. It also meant that when our residents were concerned and had questions, we knew where our partners stood on those issues and we could either stand with them or differentiate as needed. Um, we have worked closely on, uh, as you probably know from reviewing the MOU, the alcohol strategy, the community alcohol strategy was born from the MOU. That's been working well. I'll hopefully be coming back to, uh, to Committee of the Whole next month or the month after to let you know where that is at. We ended up with the municipal alcohol policy that came from the strategy as one of the recommendations. And the partners have worked really well together along with members of the community on developing the draft strategy, which is gonna take things in a very different way than it has been viewed previously. And again, that ties into livability and community harmony. Um, we do need to definitely get better at amplification of messaging that ties in with social media, how we communicate important things, but we were successful during the CFL game and working in partnership with Destination Acadia. We know that we had 8,000 downloads of our parking plan or our traffic plan, which again really helped get messaging out and we were able to develop that because we worked so closely with Destination Acadia and our staff. Um, we currently have support doing engagement for our policing services review. Ian's been working really closely with that. He is our kind of gateway to the Acadia community through that. And Sadie as well does work on that. Without those partnerships and that commitment to communication, our work internally would be so much harder. And the final piece here is just really recently we had to put out the water conservation notification 
And our first notification really did go to some key community members and to Ian Murray. So when something comes up, we know that we can basically pick up the bat phone, call our partners and get messaging out when we need to. That's unique, it's fairly special and it makes my life a lot easier. And I'd be happy to take questions. Any members of council have comments or questions? Um, Councillor Ingham? Yeah, so I am glad to hear that communications are going well and, and thank you for all that feedback. I do, I just have one quick question, maybe it's for Aaron and, and uh, um, when you had the last, when the last town and gown, when you did the presentation in November and you so-called called it a report card. So did the party, like you discussed that at the town and gown meeting and um, both parties went through and sort of said, this is what we've done and this is what we haven't done. And so is that how the, it came out? Like you didn't call it a report card, but is a report card a good idea to have every year instead of revisiting it every four years? Like, so we know where we're, we're at and we know what Acadia thinks they're doing well, what we're thinking doing well, and then we can discuss it because maybe we can do better on both ends and come together more. Yeah. I, for the report card in quotes for November, the town was the host. So town staff put that presentation together. Um, we did send it off to the partners to look at prior to just to capture from our perspective what we'd achieved so far in areas that we highlighted where we hadn't moved forward. There was some discussion with the town and gown committee, which has all the partners represented. Um, but I agree with you. I think we need to do a better job of formalizing our work and looking at the successes and, and failures, um, quite frankly, on a yearly basis, um, so that we don't, you know, we don't want to go four years and then sit down and try to identify them. So I, I think some of what we'll talk about tonight's been identified by the committee or certainly by the partners prior to this, but there's there's some ways to improve how the town and gown functions and its role, and we'll see that later on in the presentation. I think that's where that'll fit too. Um, Councillor McKay. So I went through the shared goals for the communication part on this one. And the first thing says that we will implement an integrated communications plan. I have well, develop and implement one. So is that something that is a written policy or are we just saying we'll have open lines of communication and that's our integrated plan? Because with changes in roles and as people come and go, sometimes what was maybe a quite nice banter back and forth, you could probably many times you want, should you or Ian change places or something else change, then perhaps that doesn't exist. Yeah, so a year ago when I was first kind of digging into the MOU and some of this work, I did have some preliminary conversations with their communications director um, about what a joint communications plan would look like. It didn't go much further than that, to be quite honest, and we were just so tied up in the operational to the point of kind of going back through the MOU, the MOU is meant to exist past each of our roles. Um, and so that's why it is so important to be really kind of writing into this, what those expectations are. Even without a formalized plan, with the aspirational nature of the MOU, we were always ready to step up and say, we need to work together on this. I, keep going down my yeah, list I, I don't want, I don't want to lose no you, you can okay. I don't want you to lose that point um, similar to Councillor Ingham's comment about a, a report card Councillor McKay's comment about an actual physical document is that something that we want to see council thank you for asking that question because ultimately I was going to say that all sounded great but what was the answer yeah. do we have <laughs> yeah. a plan like, do we have an actual no, no. if the you know water supply shuts down or the university yeah. goes up in smoke or whatever that it's you know step one is this person's notified step two is right. this like and then there's you know levels of immediacy in terms of communication and that kind of plan yeah i think is what we're asking and who contacts yes. who when okay. right so i'm sure i'm sure laura yeah. has taken yeah. that and go ahead uh, okay. councillor mckay um i think all of mine are going to say the same thing the MOU as it is, I think needs some tweaking, but I think there are parts of the MOU that should stand as they are. And some of these other things need to come out and almost be an operations plan, similar to what we do. I think there needs to be an agreement, a budget, and an operations plan, no different than what we do internally to, to make this partnership work. I think if all three parties would agree to that, I think that would something that 
at least it makes it clear and concise um, and you can break it down because after four years, people change $10,000 in eight years from now may only be like the present value of money would be $2,000 during oh, inflation. So, you know, so I'm just like, as I think about those things that they change. So um, over the last, now probably COVID related, we haven't done the hearings with the ASU. Will we revisit that again? And that was going to be a question. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do that? It's okay. one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I actually didn't know what the community form was until I went back into the, so we're calling community forms where people can, any concerns in the broader community have successes and challenges from the previous years. So that's what we're calling. Because it says annual form. And then we put the annual form in that communications plan that went to town and gown as one third community forum was scheduled for September as a welcoming event. Oh, that was the one that was canceled. So yeah. we're not calling those so together as community forums or are we? Yeah, so just to continue on for Barb's, just to provide some perspective, there's some things that we have not done so well in this section. So the community forum is one that I would say hasn't been done um, as well. The very first year we used the opening of Tower Park to have the representatives there and we advertised it as also a community forum where people could come and ask questions and talk to representatives from the ASU Acadia and the town. And we did have a few people come out. The second year COVID hit and we actually did an online sort of version of a, of a town hall where people could call in and ask questions. That was probably the truest forum that we did. And then it was envisioned that the next year as part of the welcome event, again, we'd have representatives there that could be engaging with the community. It got canceled. And this year, the welcoming event, it didn't really happen to that extent. So I think we can think about what a community forum would look like. It's probably one of the areas that we didn't do very well. And, and just to note another area that I did want to point out that we haven't done well, the MOU really wanted to start to get the mayor, the president, and the president of the ASU going to each other's meetings and opening dialogue. I think we've done that at least in a token way. I mean, we never used to have that consistency. Now every April, both representatives come here. I know the mayor's been to the ASU and has been at the Board of Governors, but I do think it can go further than what it has. It's been very much come present, maybe a couple questions and it's it. I do think we can try to figure out a more meaningful way that those, you know, when somebody goes to another person's or another group's meeting that we can have meaningful discussions and talk about some of the challenges and opportunities and not have it just be a presentation and it's over. So we're ticking a box, we're doing better than we did, but I don't think it's going far enough. So I just wanna know those were two points I was gonna make of where we haven't, you know, we haven't succeeded in those areas. Uh, and my last one was, so encourage and support staff on both organizations to get involved in each other's committees, projects and initiatives and improve communication. So the only one that I know of is town and gown where we actually have a formalized meeting but do we get involved in each other's um, economic development through uh, destination acadia through uh, recreation because we use them for acadia's facilities for lots of things are we actually sitting at a table and involved in each other's um, strategic plans the budgets and all of those things when, when we're looking at those specific things that we've talked about in our as our <coughs> So I'll, I'll park Destination Acadia just for the next section because it's tied into the joint economic development opportunities and I will speak to it if that's okay. Um, in terms of other opportunities, we have invited representatives of Acadia to sit on various committees of the town. Um, aside from the Town and Gown Committee. So the Environmental Sustainability Committee is an example. There was a representative. Um, the town was invited into the strategic planning process for Acadia, particularly there was a subcommittee on sort of community relations that I was invited to sit on. So that did happen. I think there's definitely some more opportunity. As part of our budget process, the town also sends off a copy of our ops plan and asks Acadia for feedback early days every year if there's anything that they want to raise or flag for us, we do that. So we have started and we're always looking for opportunities to involve each other more. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Elliott and then Councillor Ingham. I'm just wondering if you would say, Barb, that there were COVID lessons learned. I think back to the sign saying that campus was closed and people being stopped in parking lots and told they weren't allowed to walk through a parking lot. And to me, the communication, there was a gap there. 
and it was a hard time for a lot of people. Um, but it makes it makes the information even more important. Um, so do you feel that there were COVID lessons learned? Many, <laughs> many is a short answer. Um, yeah, as a communications professional, I think it's always been a rule of thumb for me to not message on behalf of folks that I can't message on behalf of. So the openness and communications that we had meant that when our residents would come in with a concern about not being able to access the Acadia campus, for example, we might be able to express a little bit more empathy, understanding our partners' rationale behind that. And then it was also an opportunity for us to continue to share that feedback with our partners at Acadia. And some of that also tied into the community harmony pieces that we were working on, which we'll touch on later. A lot of the party issues that were happening again, there were, there were very specific COVID concerns about that when we were struggling about vaccine requirements and mandates, again, a lot of that communication was important because we weren't, we weren't at the same place at the same time because we were completely different organizations um, working within the same geographical location. So yeah, many, many lessons. Bottom line, the more communications, the better. And knowing that even if you're having a rough day and everybody's mad at you, you have somebody who can understand who you can pick up the phone and have that conversation with and problem solve, which is really where communications has been helpful for us. Councillor Ingham. Um, yeah, um, Aaron, you mentioned that we could do a better job on community forums moving forward, but you, you mentioned that you are invited as a CAO and the mayor is invited uh, to talk to Dr. Ricketts and other members of Acadia. Um, more frequently than before, and that was a really positive thing. So are you bringing back those communications to the town and gown meeting? They only meet twice a year. And how can that be better communicated from what you're talking about to us as councillors and the other part of the public? So I haven't been invited to board of governors meeting, just to be clear. Okay. Uh, the mayor has presented, I think, one or two times. Once. Yeah. So I think Jeff did as well. Yeah. And has that gone back to the town and gown? No, because I think it's been more transactional where it was more of a presentation of what's happening from the town perspective. It wasn't really a, a conversation. So again, I think the town and gown might be the venue to report back or to even discuss what do we want to convey when okay. we're at each other's meetings, but to date that hasn't happened. Okay. Councillor McKay. My question is, so I, no matter the topic, whether it's recreation, pickleball courts, um, I know, sorry, <laughs> um, or economic development or whatever the topic is, do we feel like it is a partnership in communication? Because I mean, when I think of a partnership, I'll think of a marriage. Uh, we have a conversation, we go backwards and forwards. We may not start at the same place. I might want to put in new floors, but the roof needs to be done. Maybe we're like, there's, there's, maybe there's different priorities, but we have to come together and have a discussion and decide together what is the best path forward. So I often feel like the communication we have is um, information sharing, but not necessarily a partnership. And I'm wondering how we get to that. Or do, do we feel we have that? And if not, is there a plan to make it better? I, I absolutely agree with you. Yes, I, I find I'm thinking of some of the presentations I've done on our economic development aspirations. And I, and I would say, I'm sure that at a staff level, I, I know that uh, Kelton and uh, uh, certainly Kelton as one person is working very closely with Acadia on recreation things, our summer camps and so on. On some of the other things, I feel it's, it's information and perhaps it's how I communicate or the ask that we are not, uh, I, I don't have the authority to make a formal ask as, as Mayor Donovan of Acadia. And perhaps one of the things we need to do is if I, am go if I want to make an ask, it has to come from this table. I may be the, the person uh, verbalizing the ask, but it, I have counsel be behind me. Um, we are often asked uh, from Acadia for something very specific, and maybe that's the difference, that uh, an ask for X amount of dollars or an ask to support the turf field or an ask to support the uh, uh, 
um, the football game or something is quite different from saying, could we uh, get into this economic development vein uh, together, which is, I, I recognize, not very specific, but maybe there is something on us to, uh, to, to be very specific about our asks so that we can actually say, this is what we would like your support on. But I, I agree with you. In, Go ahead, Mark. If I may, in response to that, and I love that use of kind of the imagery of, of a marriage and how you build a relationship with that give and take and that flow. And just as an example, we all just went through um, a week uh, here in the town and, and we did have a very different event on Labor Day than what had happened the year before. Some of that was because of COVID. Some of that was based on feedback from our partners. And last year, um, which falls a little bit more into community harmony, but it is actually more so communications, we were messaging, we had our pilot project, we had the signs up in the neighborhood about kind of setting expectations. And we used those, you know, those core plus signs because we couldn't interact with people in the way we had done historically because COVID. And we got mixed feedback about how that went over. And by mixed, I mean predominantly negative, um, which, which I wear. But one of the learning kind of pieces for us was having that good feedback through the ASU, through our partners at Acadia, we were able to approach it in a very different way this year. So our morning that we spent with the RAs was really about unpacking the intricacies of the nuisance party bylaw and really making sure that as peer-to-peer -peer messengers, the RAs were able to prepare folks going out into the community for the realities of one of our biggest tools when it comes to enforcement around community harmony. Uh, we also had an opportunity, we were invited to do that same presentation to the staff at the ACTS. And we were able to pivot a message in a different way. I hope it's gonna be more effective. Again, that was based on that feedback, that difficult feedback where somebody had to come to us and say, yeah, it didn't go over so well. Can we do better this year? And I think we did. And that takes trust and good, good relationship development. Good. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I was reminded, we also have a Katie reps that sit on accessibility and also on the library working group, we had a representative. So I just wanted to mention that before we moved on. From the university on our Yes. Okay, so joint economic development opportunities is the next area. And if I was delivering this presentation six months ago, I would probably have been less optimistic that we were gonna make some headway in this area. It's been one that's been challenging to identify opportunities for partnership. I think there's been challenges to link the WBDC and the business community um, two opportunities that the university can provide, both from a faculty perspective and from a student perspective. And the whole piece around Destination Acadia and how we manage events together has been a source of frustration. The CFL was a really good opportunity for us to work together on an event. And the Destination Acadia position had been vacant for some time. So there had been a person in the role doing that, I think, amongst a whole other portfolio, you know, pieces of the portfolio. And a new manager has been hired where that is their focus. And I can really see a difference in terms of the engagement with the town that I didn't see six months ago. And after the CFL happened, um, mm -hmm. that individual, uh, Tanya Colburn, who's now working with Destination Acadia, reached out to the town to say, let's debrief. I want to learn what could we do better. And we took that as an opportunity to relay concerns we'd heard from the business community, but among others, talk about some of that initial um, discussion. We want to be a partner from the beginning because we can make events better if the town is there and, and can identify areas of opportunity. And I really felt that she listened um, and there's a genuineness to want to work together. So sitting here now, you know, the, the biggest success we have is the CFL under our belts. I do think there'll be more and I do think you'll see um, that partnership work. Is there a table to sit at? I think Tanya is still trying to figure out what this destination Acadia looks like and how the town will engage in that. But again, feeling a lot more optimistic than I did six months ago. So I, I think that's a, a great step. Um, there's still a whole lot of work we can do together on the economic development front. 
that we haven't done. This is an area that I would I would give us a D if I was giving us a grade uh, in terms of how we've we've been able to move forward. But there's a lot of opportunity in the housing discussion that I that you'll likely have later. There's some opportunity in that that I think does fit some of these uh, economic goals. But just overall, that's that's where I would I would say we land. I think the Wolfles Farmers Market is a really interesting opportunity, and trying to understand the role that each partner plays in that success is going to be really important as the farm market looks to expand. Um, and I think there's been a little bit of, okay, who's on first, who plays what role, um, what's the expectation of Acadia. And I think there's a real opportunity through this that we might be able to uh, improve how we collaborate on that file. Um, but other than that, those are the comments that I wanted to make. I, I think improvements on the destination Acadia side, still a lot of work to do on the economic development file. But I think the mayor's task force identified some good opportunities. And if we can use that as a basis to move forward, we might be able to, to focus ourselves a little bit more strategically. Comments, questions? I'm not letting you off the hook without a question. <laughs> um, I, I thank you for that, the last comment. I, I think with, with respect to economic development, this is maybe one area that the town stands, or that I feel that the town might stand to gain more than Acadia, although I could make a strong arg argument that that it would be uh, any economic development opportunities that Acadia assists with, I think is great marketing opportunity for Acadia. But I, when I, certainly the mayor's task force looked at how can we retain students? How can we, how can we attract that kind of entrepreneurial mind? What, can, what does Acadia bring to that attraction? Um, we've talked and I have talked to Dr. Ricketts and, and uh, on behalf of council, I sent a letter of support around housing on campus uh, for senior students who, who may want to do uh, uh, not just their, uh, the last few years of their undergraduate, but perhaps some of the graduate programs. I really see that as a huge win for the town and it is, I've been frustrated that I have had no traction at all from Acadia in a little in, in a small way, I'm going to blame COVID for that, but as we move out of that, hopefully some of the initiatives that, uh, that we talked about, uh, along with the STEAM program, and certainly as we move uh, on with the development of, of the library and some of the spaces and attractions that could be part of the library, I would hope to see Acadia be part of that. But um, I definitely think that there are joint opportunities i don't feel that it's been uh, i don't I, I don't feel that somehow we have got the have inspired acadia to see that too and that's something i would absolutely hope that we can work on together uh councillor ingham um, thank you for that mayor donovan i'm just wondering if there's any way that we can work a little bit more with destination acadia in this MOU or is are they able to have a seat at, at the town and gown? It just seems like I, I did, I do think that after the football game, you know, we heard more about them, right? I mean, it, and I'm glad that you're working better together, um, but how can we get involved in it a little bit more? I've checked their website out, it's great. How can we, how can we link things together that are going on in the town and are going on there? Like what, what can we do? It's just I just I, I looked at it and I was like, wow, this is fantastic. It talks about Wolfville, it talks about housing, it talks about all these things. How can we link it onto our website? How can we work with Destination Acadia a little bit more since they've you know hired a new director and everything like that? I just I feel like it might be a key piece for us. That's all. I think there's oh, lots sorry, of ways. That's okay. I think there's lots of ways we can tie them together. I actually Think we just need to pump their tires a little bit more in our game to say come and do the things that they yeah, want to do exactly. here um yeah. i've been in contact and, I'll, and i do want to meet her again tanya but i because we're hosting the junior golf tournament here next year i've gone to her and said can we rent out acadia like this this would be great for our town this would be great for acadia can we rent out these spaces but only because i knew that yeah. so i think it's about making those linkages and sometimes i think we're the conduit to, to that and somehow making that together with the WBDC or whoever else that looks. But I think there's some really good conversations to have around that. But um, yeah, I think there's lots of ways we can use it. And Tanya's sitting on the WBDC board now as well. So that will provide another uh, linkage to the business community. 
So the next section was managing our facilities and infrastructure in a strategic manner. Um, probably give this one a C <laughs> if I'm going to quote my theme and grading. Uh, there's been some wins, definitely. And I do want to give a shout out mm -hmm. because I think one of the early wins that Acadia did provide was they did provide at no cost access to the space at the Festival Theater for community groups, which had a tremendous impact on some of our local groups. So that was a win from the MOU that I think was, was a really important one to recognize. We're still trying to figure out the financial contributions that you know, if the town wants to continue to make to Acadia, what that looks like and what the expectation is in return. The 35,000 that's provided annually is challenging because we don't really have a good idea of what that's being used for other than it's going into a sort of a general pot to maintain the complex. And now with the one-off requests that come in for the pool, how we can maybe do that in a better way, I think is, is really important. And there's going to be a slide a little bit later just to talk about the monetary contributions and how council would want us to handle that. But that's been, that's been challenging. And I think the extra layer of us trying to determine what if anything will happen with a regional facility is kind of stalled you know us being able to move forward but again brian finnis is new we've got a new athletic director that's really interested to to dig in and has some ideas on how that accountability back to council for the dollars can be um, brought forward and accounted for so i think we'll get there but it's been a challenge in the past so i, I just want to identify that that's been uh, difficult um, we did do the joint EV charging station, so, so that was a project that we were able to do together. We did work together on the Acadia Athletic Complex business plan. Um, through that process, it, we realized fairly quickly that we weren't in a position to actually complete a full business plan, and it, it asked more questions than answered, but it was a good basis to get us thinking about where some of the deficiencies are and, and is helping informing our future work. I think Tower Field has been also a huge success. When we had to move our skateboard park, that was something that Acadia worked very quickly with us to update the lease and to provide that space at no cost to us in a long-term lease. And I think we've been able to provide a really interesting pocket of recreational opportunities on campus that weren't there before. And really the goal was to try to bring in younger families and, and folks that weren't associated with the university onto campus so that we could build those relationships. And really have heard some positive feedback from that. Um, the day camps have been provided by Acadia on our behalf. That happened, I think it was about five years ago that we made that decision. Um, that's something that will be reviewed as part of this MOU, whether that's something that will continue on or whether there's an interest in maybe us delivering that in a different way. One area that I, I think we really haven't scratched the surface on that's important, and the ASU did raise this um, with us a number of years ago as a priority, is the Acadia Farm and what we might be able to do collaboratively around that. We haven't done anything with it collaboratively. The ASU has really embraced that as a project, but the town hasn't really stepped up to be involved. And I, I think that's an area that go forward could really be something that we work on collaboratively. But to this point, we have not done that. So that's kind of my, my take on that section on, you know, we've had some wins and there's still some work to do. Questions, comments, council? Oh, Councilor McKay, your light. Sorry, I can see it. Um, so some of those were all good too, and I and I think the one at Tower Park was really good. I think, um, but then again, closing it during COVID to our residents when it was sort of a joint project. I, I, again, I think it's coming back to that communication thing and how does that work? Uh, and the discussion on the pickleball feels like we didn't really make the headway that maybe we thought we might. Um, and then the camps. I'm curious as to those because they are offered and we say on our behalf, but they are not solely for willful residents. So I'm curious as to what our contribution, I don't know what our contribution is, but what it gets us in return for our value when it is just an open market because you can come from Halifax to take the camps if that's what you want to do. Um, so I'm what is the report mechanism that goes along with with those things as well. And Kelton, you may be able to weigh on that specifically because I haven't seen the, the reports that come back, but that'll be part of what we do in the review. And just, just a point of clarification, there were a lot of areas of campus that were off limits to residents during COVID, but they did keep Tower Community Park open for residents. Did you want to add anything? Uh, the formalized reporting for the camps have have been limited. It's not written into any agreement, um, which can be updated with with a renewed MOU. Okay. 
Okay. Move on to the next one. I'll just I'll just keep going. Um, so the next one, the leveraging the academic opportunities, we have not made any headway on this really at all. Um, this one's a, a difficult one because it's not really an area that the town can do much with. We really need Acadia to kind of take leadership on that file. And in the middle of you know, this MOU period, COVID happened and it was very challenging, I think, for, for that to happen. I also think, though, it does bring up um, a concern in that how do we get the right folks from the academic side of the institution to be involved in these MOU discussions so that we're not putting things in an MOU that maybe aren't even filtering down through the organization. So I'm not sure how many on the academic side, for example, would even know this is in the MOU and how, how can we improve that? I will say that fostering the relationship between staff and the community development department has been excellent in the last four years. We've had some great students come in and be part of our team and we've had some really good projects that have come out of that relationship. So that's definitely a win. But in terms of a subject matter expert list at Acadia that we can, um, that we can leverage or just trying to, to really utilize the resources at the university um, to help meet some of the local community needs and provide interesting projects for students and for faculty, I think we could do a better job. Um, that's when I'll be very curious when Acadia does sort of their debrief of whether, you know, what their perspective is and does this stay in, does it make sense or what can they do to help move the needle on this one? Because this one's more probably in their area than ours where some of the other ones might lean more towards the town than Acadia. Professor Ingham? Yeah, we do have the opportunity. I mean, we are a university town. We have a lot of retired people here that have gone to Acadia. So we could have a sort of a mentoring side on that too, where the where the community is providing um, subject matter to Acadia also that are pretty retired. So it could work both ways. I thought you were going to mention there, and I'm not sure all these people are retired Acadia profs, well, I, but there's a mentoring program. Yeah, uh, I don't know about it. Yes. So, so communication. Sure. Um, yes. So yes, I didn't mean to say just retired. I just sometimes I think that our community is underutilized with all, all the people that I mean, you can be retired at 40. We can say that it's just when people are no longer in the role that they may have trained for. Is that better stated? Um, yeah, anyway, retired is not a bad word. It say there is a mentoring program. Yeah, and, I don't and know. We don't know about I it. don't know much about it. So that's what I'm saying. I just wanted to reiterate there's a lot of people in that community that can also provide education to students that are just coming here. Maybe they're from the same um, country or the same town. We can foster that. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Uh, so strategic planning, this one's fairly quick. Um, the town has invited Acadia into many of our planning processes. We invite them into our municipal planning process. As I mentioned, every year we send them the ops plan and ask them to weigh in as part of the budget process. And they did invite us to participate um, in their strategic planning, as I mentioned, um, through the lens of the community relations piece. So I think that one has started. I think there's more planning we could do together, but there's more of a concerted effort to involve each other in our planning processes. I think probably in that, uh, it's not strategic planning specifically, but uh, first time I'm aware, this council has been invited to participate in the, with the search committee for the new president. And that, uh, as I've mentioned, will happen sometime in the latter half of October. Uh, but that's, uh, I thought that was a, a great opportunity for us with respect to strategic directions for both of our organizations. And I, and I did have a lovely lunch with the uh, the chairman of the board of governors uh, last week which i also think is if, if not a first it's certainly i'm not aware that it's happened in recent years and the final one last but definitely not least uh is the community harmony piece and barb and kaden and kelton probably all want to weigh in on this with me um, this has been the area that I would say we have worked um, the closest with our partners on. Um, this is a weekly discussion that we have with our partners and we're always looking for opportunities to make improvements. We haven't always had successes. There's still a lot of work to do, but it's probably the area that I can say the most effort has gone into as, as you look at the MOU. As looking at some of the specific deliverables, the community alcohol strategy, as I mentioned, um, is pretty much ready in draft form to come forward. 
we were kind of waiting for the MOU discussion because we don't just want one partner to own it. So we didn't want to bring it to council before we're bringing it to Acadia and the ASU and the WBDC and some of the other partners that really need to take some ownership of this document and, and work on implementing it together. So it will come forward. We did collaborate on it, but you haven't seen it yet. I think there's been a lot of work on the staff level to identify those points of contact for residents that have concerns um, to contact. Uh, Caden on our side and Olivia um, on Acadia's side have been key, along with Sadie and the work of the ASU. Uh, so that is improving. We did um, pitch an idea of having a joint community liaison position that would have been jointly funded. That didn't ultimately happen, but I think this was more of a, a creative way to leverage the resources we already had to try to move forward on that work. We haven't moved forward with a residence advisor program for off campus areas, but stay tuned. I think you'll see something coming on that fairly soon um, through Kelton Shop. Um, so communicating with landlords about their responsibilities and helping landlords establish appropriate rental agreements for student housing. This is one that we obviously have started. This is an ongoing discussion on how we can work with landlords to, to improve the community harmony situation. There's a lot of ideas. Uh, council will be talking about a licensing program or how we might connect with, with landlords in a different way. We've already started to move towards a lot of that. We have a pretty good database now that we will be sharing with council when we talk about this um, in November. So we've taken some key steps. So I think that's an area that we'll continue to move forward with. Really looking at the NAJP or non-academic judicial process to address issues where appropriate and the code of conduct is an ongoing issue. So this MOU was really the catalyst to have a code of conduct that Acadia contemplate off-campus behavior. Prior to that, that wasn't in the MOU. So that was a huge step. The next step is how we utilize that. And so I think incrementally there's been some improvements, but I think there's obviously, you know, we're hearing from our citizens and there's been some concerns expressed um, internally that that can likely improve and how the town can help Acadia in, in doing that, I think is really important, but that's an area that I think continues to be a topic of discussion. Um, you know, originally we had uh, Blair McMurtry as our compliance officer, and he did keep some hours on campus. Uh, then COVID happened and Caden hasn't yet started having hours on campus and whether that's something that we want to continue to do or not, we'll, we'll reevaluate. Um, and there was funding provided uh, by the town to help work on the comprehensive alcohol strategy. We didn't end up really leveraging any of that because we did a lot of it internally. So, but we did early days a number of years ago have a small amount that was used to support meetings, but we didn't actually need it for external assistance. So lots of work to do. Um, I'm gonna invite you, I know Barb had some ideas and thoughts. I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add to that kind of overview on this topic of community harmony or not. So I think that mic works. I won't run up to the podium simply because my colleagues might want to uh, add some, some comments. And again, this ties in really closely to communications and the engagement work that we've been doing. And it does also start to overlap with our policing services review um, through our work this year, kind of preparing for O week Again, with all of the partners involved, we really wanted to set those expectations for um, what we consider to be great community behavior and also really raising awareness about what happens when you, you know, fail to fly under the radar, so to speak. And we were certainly pleased that, again, as Council knows, the, the door knocking event that happened this year was led by Olivia in her role, and that it wasn't so much this year about the town of Wolfville speaking to new residents and saying, this is what is acceptable, but that messaging is now coming from Acadia saying you represent us, you're part of this Acadia um, family and organization, and we have this brand and we, we hope you're gonna live up to it. And so we're hoping that that shift um, and that direct messaging coming from our partners at Acadia is gonna really help to uh, shift stuff in a positive direction. So that's pretty much what I would add. And I'm not sure if Kelton or if Caden wanted to add anything. Again, happy to answer any questions. And, and just on that, and I, I was gonna say it on the next slide, but I'll say it sort of in the context of this. When this MOU was originally drafted, we wanted to make it specific <laughs> enough that the partners were really held to account that it wasn't so high level that folks looked at it and said, this is just gonna sit on a shelf, it doesn't say anything. But I think in our, in our quest to do that, we made it so specific 
that very quickly some of these issues or ideas became maybe not the areas of focus and they were replaced by other things. And as residents give us feedback on things they'd like us to achieve or the partners identify different opportunities, the video cameras are an example or you know what we did with Welcome Week, it's always going to change depending on the circumstance. So the idea of having this as sort of an overarching strategic document and then having that process where an annual operations plan that we jointly create sort of feeds in the specific, that may change year to year. And it's hard to know at the beginning of a four-year cycle everything that's going to need to be done in that four years. So I just this is one area that I feel like as soon as we wrote the MOU, we went off in some different directions and tried other things that aren't reflected even in this. So I, I just note that I was going to note on the next slide, but it's a good time to kind of say, I think the structure of it is a little bit limiting because there's a lot we've done that isn't listed here and there's still a lot we have to do that we didn't even contemplate. Comments, questions, Councillor Elliott. So we haven't achieved a code of conduct yet. We have a code of conduct. Yeah. Yes, that does um, but specify. Is it, is it transparent? So if there's an issue and a compliance officer has to deal with it and it's an off campus, it's a student off campus, do we have any way of knowing, not names or anything, but whether there has been some consequences? Yeah. And I make it came to speak to this. I can say, generally speaking, um, when there's a nuisance party order issued or an SOT under our bylaw, we share that information with the KDS. So they can follow up through their code of conduct. Uh, we've received some general statistics from Acadia around how many code of conduct complaints um, for off-campus behavior were investigated. I haven't had updated statistics in a while, but there was some in the presentation that was made last year to, to Committee of the Whole. Um, Caden has an ongoing relationship with Olivia, though, and that's why I thought you might want to weigh in, because I think information probably flows a little bit more between the two of you that you could speak to better than I can. Yeah, no, for sure. So I do speak with Olivia on a very frequent uh, basis. So when we get an MPO and no matter the name, we'll always send it over. So we have that agreement with her. And if it is a student, she follows the procedures uh, with Acadia. So once it gets to her, um, as Aaron mentioned, I, I don't get uh, much stats after that. So I trust with her to follow up and do uh, uh, everything accordingly. So, but if that's something in the future that council would like, we can look into, uh, it's definitely a possibility. Did you say MPO? Correct. Yeah, a nuisance party order. MPO. MPO. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Councillor Elliott? Yeah, I just, I just feel like there could be greater transparency around those NPOs. <laughs> am I right in well, just that's possible? Am I right in saying part of the issue is uh, confidentiality, both at the university, the police? The, the, yeah. the RCMP's involvement, so it is not as it is not as simple as I think we would like it because yeah. we don't control all the strings. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess. Councillor Proudfoot. Um, I have a comment or suggestion, but I just want to question Councillor Elliott, if I may. Sure. Transparency in the, re in the sense of knowing who infracted <laughs> the NPO? I mean, no, just knowing that, you know, there were this many NPOs issued and there were this many students who had to deal with consequences. Because right now it just kind of goes off into the void, doesn't it? It does. And is there any, you know, like at university, it's it's about learning on campus and off campus. I think that the issue is that there's a legal issue here. Yeah, yeah. That, that we have no control over. Well, I think that's why I was asking the question because yeah. I was I was hoping that Councillor Elliott wasn't looking for names, yeah. taking names and taking numbers and whatever. Um, but I, I I'm I'm stuck on even knowing how many NPOs and I laugh every time there's an acronym. I'm sorry. Every how many NPOs are issued, how many are, are followed up, and, and what the ramifications are because I guess. I would say if we have that information, then what? Like, is it helpful for us to know that there were 10 issued and nine were followed up and they were, so now we know nine of 10 were dealt with? Like, I that's think what, what I'm we're wondering. seeing, and we do get this at RCMP and I'm just pulling your numbers out of, so the yep. 10 were issued and one was resulted in any consequence. And sometimes the RCMP will, Jody's and Mike, you sit on that. 
um, will say uh, investigated, there was no there there, uh, but sometimes it's just, it, it does just kind of lie there. Hmm. And we don't know, obviously there was something there or our staff wouldn't have gone and identified an issue and yet nothing comes back. And my reason for asking or for, for trying to just get further into the conversation is because I just feel like we as a society and, and people in general are inundated with information. So if we're getting more, for, more information, what are we doing with it? Why do we need it? That's all. That was my only reason for the question. Um, my light was on though, because I was thinking about some of the connections between um, committees or boards that that we have committees that we have that we invite representation from the university, either the university proper or and or the ASU. I was thinking about the flip side, and I don't know a lot about the committees of the Board of Governors, but I did just Google it. And there is a committee of the Board of Governors called the Student Life Committee. And I don't know if there's any possibility, flexibility on the makeup of that committee. I suspect if it doesn't already, which we sh are pretty sure it doesn't, include a representative from town corporate, maybe it could. And I'm sure that that would mean a uh, bylaw um, reconstitution, but maybe something to ask at least. Thanks. Thank Councilor McKay. Yeah, uh, and I don't, I guess the transparency for me to follow up on Councilor Elliott's is, it's not, I mean, informa all information is good information in, in my opinion. Um, and if we are continually adding on staff and spending taxpayers' dollars on compliance issues, and we are doing this, and then we're sending information over to our partners and saying it, and I'm sure it's not, but if everything just fell to zero, then why are we doing it? Because clearly we are fulfilling our part of an agreement, but it's not going anywhere else. But if, there, if we got stats back to say, yes, um, there's a, there's a conversation, the stats are good, uh, we are issuing them and there is follow-up or we're issuing them for the wrong reasons, maybe. I mean, there's information to be gathered from what we get as stats back. So for me, it is a learning experience of, did, did it go anywhere? Do we do it properly? If not, what are we doing wrong? And can we do it differently? Yes, and, and I and I do think there is a partner not in the room and probably shouldn't be a signatory to this, and that's the RCMP around some of the community living things, not all, a part of it. Um, and there, we are working on that. Other comments? I do have one. I just written down some notes, and it it strikes me that, with respect to to the behavioral parts of community harmony, and there's a lot more to community harmony including the recreational um, and, and cultural things that we've talked about. I know staff at, in the town, and, and this may be an internal operational thing, council operational thing that we have to do, staff and of the town and uh, staff at the university and some community members talk weekly. I have, as mayor, I have the benefit of meeting with the CAO, and if anything big comes up, we do have that conversation. And eventually, if it, if it raises to the area of issue, then it does, in a, in a very broad sense, come to this council table. But this council, who you might say we are at the level of, of the ASU, because they are an elected group, is not really involved in some of those discussions. And what I think I am hearing around this table is that while we are, as council, the signatory to this MOU, we may not know nearly as much as the other signatories do. And I think that's an internal issue that, that we need to, to deal with. There was, when I was, before I was on council, the pre-runner to town and gown met every month. Now it only meets twice a year. And we have talked on town and gown that that's not nearly enough, but maybe, maybe, there is an operational thing internally we have to do because it is this council that gets Noel's letters uh, and Lee's letters and Bob's letters and George's letters. We do hear that and, and sometimes I feel that I don't know what's going on or my only recourse is not to respond to you as council but to say let me ask staff and, and I just think that's an operational thing that internally on this issue we need to figure out how we handle that because I 
suspect there is a lot going on that, that Ian and, and Aaron and Kelton and Barb and, you know, and, and their counterparts at the university are discussing. I'm not sure we know that. Yeah, a, a couple things. I think, um, I think that in the CAO report to Cal, that maybe having a section that just gives an update on the community harmony aspect and really the MOU overall might be helpful just to help improve that on a regular basis. When I look at the presentation that was made last year, we did get some information from James Sanford and I'm kind of looking at Ian because I think we can get updated information um, to provide to council so that you can see, is this the level of transparency that you're looking for? Because this is a level of information that Acadia has made publicly available. Granted, this is out of date. So take that with a grain of salt. But um, the last time we did this presentation, Acadia had proceeded with formal investigations against 14 students for off-campus incidents with 11 of these students receiving sanctions. And this was prior to the SOT, the summary offense ticket information sharing. So then after November 23rd of last year, when SOT uh, sharing was put in place, Acadia investigated 11 students and sanctioned eight. And they were in the process of investigating four others that had been involved in an incident on April 24th. And in November, we also, through the town, were able to provide 26 historical SOTs, um, and we did provide those to Acadia. Six of those related to a joint investigation with Acadia Athletics at the time, and sanctions were provided under the Athletics Code of Conduct to those individuals. And due to the historical nature, the remaining SOTs were filed for future information if there was another infraction. So James was providing that information at that level. So maybe getting an updated sort of summary of what's happened under the code of conduct might be helpful. And then council can take that and go, okay, through the MOU, is, is that sufficient? And how often do you wanna get that information? And that communications piece might help solve some of the concerns. Question, uh, some of the comments that were brought up by uh, people at uh, public input tonight, including a, a, the letter that uh, Bob Lutz referenced, where does, where does that, where do those questions and where does that information factor into our process? So I think that letter was sent to um, Acadia and Acadia responded. So I'm not sure how that fits into the MOU discussion. Well, it did. It, I, it did get but sent the, the to points, me, yeah. the points in there, um, one way right. or the other members of council have seen, I, I don't want, right. I don't want to lose the points, points in the letter. Okay. So I thought or, you meant the just, letter. Okay. Not just that letter, but the points that, that, that the community brings up, how, how did those get incorporated in this process? So I think if we can move towards um, a process where we have sort of that annual operations plan that picks the priorities. You know, some of the concerns that were raised by Bob, I think have been shared by the partners, having more programming on campus, Look, looking at the addresses, there are some privacy issues that, that have been raised by Acadia, and I think that's something we need to explore. Um, in looking at the code of conduct go forward, one of the suggestions um, that's been raised has been, how do residents make a complaint directly if there's a concern and not have to funnel it through the town? So that again can be a conversation that happens. If we have that annual operations plan, we're able to identify some of those immediate requirements and then action them where we can. Um, certainly those have been on the radar and having more events on campus is something that Acadia has, has identified as being a priority for them too. So we're working to try to make that happen a little bit more meaningfully this year as we come into some of the key key events. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, and I'm not sure if this, I mean, in my mind, it fits under community harmony, but where does equity, diversity and inclusion come in? So we're going to have a slide that says what's okay. missing because that was not contemplated in this okay. at all. So this nope. is just looking at what's there currently. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, so just thinking of those six, are there any that you feel? Lightly. Are there any that you feel need to be, in, you know, stay in, in any kind of revised MOU? And are any of those six, any of those that you feel maybe could be open for discussion, could maybe not be in the MOU? Do they all resonate with you? We're going to get into what's missing, but of those six, are any of them irrelevant now? Yeah. <laughs> I can back this up. I can't. Uh... 
I'm so sad. There we go. Yes, if I might. Maradon, do you mind if I go? No, sorry. sorry. Yes, <laughs> I know you were in deep thoughts. On, so I was. I didn't want to so I think communication, economic development, um, I guess infrastructure and I don't know if recreation is a separate topic or the same one within it, but maybe it's maybe it maybe needs a separate topic because um, it could mean programming and everything else too. So I'm not so I have those as um, all of those. To me, all of those should stay. I think there's a couple we're missing. I don't again, I don't think they should be. I think they should be listed in the MOU. What they entail should be an addendum or a plan or something else, but I think them listed um, is, I guess, the academic opportunities. I mean, I'd like to see it stay because I think that would be really valuable, but um, granted, that's not something that we are taking to the table. So if Katie was willing for it to stay, I think that would be great. Um, yeah, so I, I think they're all valuable. Everybody? Yeah. And then I, I mentioned this is the each goal is supported by several objectives and a number of these haven't been met. Can we improve the structure? And this is where I get into just laundry listing tasks, specific tasks is probably not the, the right layout for the MOU go forward, at least from my perspective. So there's probably a different way that we can we can manage that. So what's missing? So you know, we've identified that there's some real opportunities to partner in um, EDI initiatives, housing and recreation are three that have come out of recent council discussions uh, and also through staff. What else um, is missing? And then there was a specific around EDI, you know, what does that mean to you in terms of the MOU if there's some early thoughts on that? Equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, and and that's also oh, Councillor McKay, Councillor Proudfoot, Councillor Ng. So I have a question on the equity, diversity, and inclusion. And it because we're part of Diversity Kings, um, in, when I was thinking about it, it was I, I don't. There's there's no boundaries on any of these topics. So whether we're in Kings, in Wolfville, on campus, off campus, um, it all should be the same. So. Is there a way for the parties of Acadia, us, Kings, all of the things that surround us work together on that? Because I know we, our last motion for um, was to partner with the municipality, but is that the best solution for us? Or is it a combination of all three of us or four or five of us getting together and doing that together? Because um, I think there's valuable lessons from, from every perspective. It's a question more than an answer. You like long? Sorry. Councillor Proudfoot? I guess my question is, and I don't know that anyone necessarily around the horseshoe has an answer, but what do we mean when we say EDI? And I've and I heard what you said, Councillor McKay, but I'm still sitting here going, like EDI is not a thing, right? So you talk about housing, you talk about recreation, those are things that make sense. But EDI is not a thing. Um, I would encourage us to take a step back from this document and its goals and objectives and interweave EDI throughout it. So it's not an additional goal. It's not an additional objective. Within the goals that we currently have and the objectives that we currently have, we put the lens of EDI at the forefront so that when we're looking at partnerships, we're providing opportunities for those who wouldn't necessarily have that opportunity. Or when we're talking about housing, we think about EDI in terms of housing for whom. So I think it's an interwoven. I don't think it's a separate goal. Councillor Ingham. Um, thank you for that, um, Councillor McKay and uh, Councillor Proudfoot. Um, I do think it is an important piece, um, and I am going to just use the EDI. Um, that we perhaps partner a little bit more with the ASU in that because you know there are so many international students here coming from different countries. Um, 
so I think that could be also important, but also um, being on the accessibility committee, that's also another one that maybe we want to include too. We do have uh, James um, Sanford that comes to that meeting often, but sends Megan uh, Swanberg and also Emily Duffett, who's, who works at Acadia on that committee too. And they are free to share many, many of what's going on at Acadia and it's very beneficial to the town. Um, so if we could maybe add that component in also. Any other comments? Councilor Shea? So a question. So I, I don't disagree with Councilor Crawford. I think it's a great idea. So my question is then how do, is EDI um, a topic that we want to say here, let's put a group of people so to look at our MOU so that we are always looking at that. Like, is there, is, how, how would we do that? I guess is the question with that in there. Is it, is it, we have a committee that says, we're gonna look at all of these objectives of the MOU through an EDI lens and make sure those things are implemented together. Um, somebody with some expertise and some, you know, some knowledge around that, those conversations. I don't know the answer. Take yeah, I'm happy to respond. And and it's a it's a extensive conversation to have, and there's lots of opportunities um, for examples. But if I open it and the first thing I see, the parties will communicate. So on the communication, the first one says jointly develop and implement an integrated communications plan. That is at a level that all people reading it can understand. Done. Yeah. Right. So it's it's thinking about what each of those mean with the lens of, is it equitable? Is it diverse and is it integrated? And accessible. And accessible. That seems to make sense to me, just for what it's worth. So as opposed to a separate goal, it is it is the goal of our organizations, all of our organizations. So uh, as we look at what we're doing through those lenses, uh, we would, look at everything this MOU is doing and because we're really just furthering the goals of our individual organizations. Okay. And there'll be time, like if you think of something else that's missing, but this is just really helpful to kind of frame the beginning of our process. Uh, this is one that maybe I'll just sort of leave for, for further thought, and we may not sort of unpack this all tonight, but I think as we go through the MOU, the monetary commitments between the three parties probably can be better defined. Um, there's a question of whether we want to put those in the MOU or not. Um, but if we do right now, they're kind of spread out throughout the different sections and it's not really clear when you're reading the MOU sort of what's going in what direction in terms of, of contributions it doesn't really contemplate the one offs that we do together. And so currently, you know, there are some statements in the MOU around what Acadia will provide and I mentioned the Acadia Festival Theatre being provided um, to community groups at cost recovery and that's been really helpful. There's dollar amounts that the town contributes for the bursaries, for co-hosting events, for the athletic center, and for the day camps. And you know, we'll we'll figure out what the right number might be because I, I think that's been a challenge since the day we we signed this. But I guess the, the question I'd ask right now is would you like some clarity in the MOU around the financial contributions? Do you feel it belongs in the MOU or do you feel it belongs more like as one-off requests that should come in depending on the circumstance? because I don't think the MOU as it exists right now clearly captures it well. And it doesn't necessarily say in exchange for whatever money is going in whatever direction, this is the expectation back. So just kind of looking, I mean, we're not gonna solve the dollar amounts tonight or anything, but just looking for some feedback on how you, you think we should handle this discussion. That's a crapper. When I look at those two columns on the screen, the first thing that makes me go, hmm, is that on the right, they are all dollar amount specific. On the left, they aren't. And I think my first reaction is to say that I don't know that the dollar amount specifically is a good idea to write into it, because I think that that allows for changes as we carry on through our financial situations um, and economic uh, um, impacts. So I, I think having wording around it and it being in there, I'm, I'm in support of that for sure, but I'm not so sure that the specific dollar amounts make sense to me. Thank you. Councilor McKay. 
it's a, it's a little bit tricky because I'm sure that um, these are in here because they were asked for annual contributions from Acadia that maybe needed those to keep them going. And if we wanted them, we had to pay for them as you do most things. Um, so I'm, I'm not in favor of them being part of the MOU, but I think they should be a separate item, but whatever that looks like. Um, and I, I'm a big believer in what do you, on the value, the value of money. Um, so what is the value we get for $35,000? What is, you know, and, and that only listed some of the things we just changed. Um, yeah, this is things. just putting up okay. some thought. I'm um, reminded that there was another slide that might be helpful. <laughs> okay. Because my, the one of is what keep, keeps coming to mind for me. It's here's a list of the dollars that we give annually, plus we give to the pool, which we've done the last two, three, three we, years. One year, and there's a current ask okay. that will be coming back. Um, and, and the field and, and all th those other things that just come out as one ops as well. Um, and what are we getting in return for the taxpayers? Because it's not it's not my money; it's people's money. So, um, I guess if when we get back to negotiation between the parties, what is necessary uh, to keep things going for the people who use them, um, and what do we get in return for that money? Councillor Proudfoot, I wonder if the concept is reflected in the MOU. But to your point, Councillor McKay that specific amounts are in an operational plan, right? So then that way they can be fluid if they need to be and, and yeah. What, what I think is missing is, uh, and I don't wanna add another principle, but the something that speaks to the principle of equal uh, financial or in-kind contribution. Uh, and certainly it looks, uh, the previous slide looks very imbalanced. Um, and I, you know, we could add to that slide the, you know, uh, most of most of Caden and Sean's time, frankly, is not, there's, there's a small amount, I'm going to say, that is spent on na uh, neighbor disputes in, uh, on Widden Street. Um, and, and much more of, of their time is spent in the core. Uh, much more of, of council's time, frankly, is spent on, on that. So if we had a true um, under, a commitment that the principle of fiscal equity was there and whether that's uh, uh, actual dollars that come from the taxpayer uh, versus um, access, not just at cost, but access to spaces at Acadia. Um, I know if, if the deputy mayor was here, I'm sure she would have talked about the, the market. Um, there's, a, there's a significant uh, dollar amount that we are being asked for when it, you know, there's no, there's, that it seems to be non-negotiable. So I, I don't really, I, you know, I think Acadia or uh, the, the Legion can come to the town and say, we need X number of dollars to do this and whatever council is sitting here will decide whether that's uh, what our taxpayers want. But this, this view that we will equitably support each other with our finances, Councillor uh, Elliot uh, mentioned Queens, that came uh, after a huge blowout uh, uh, at, uh, at Queens uh, with their homecoming and a fair bit of damage. So that was, uh, uh, not a one-off, but that was very specific uh, to to Queens. Certainly, I've mentioned it around this table in, uh, in other universities in the United States, recognizing we have different funding models in Canada than the United States. There's a lot more actual dollars coming from universities to their towns, commitments to re um, to creating better housing in towns and and skill development for people who live in towns. It, it would be wonderful if we could work towards that and then, you know, not worry about the kind of nickel and diming that does happen over, is it 10,000 or is it 12,000? That would be, that'd be good. The word That's I was thing. thinking was reciprocity. Reciprocity, perfect. I would agree with that. Okay, I think we're good.
So the committee itself, uh, the terms of reference are outlined in the MOU. And originally the thought was that this wasn't really a working committee per se, um, but it was meant to kind of be the, the leadership of the partners that could come together, give direction, be a place where staff could come and say, we're hitting a roadblock, help us. Um, the decision makers that have the ability to do that. It hasn't probably worked to that um, initial ideal. Uh, we did have COVID, we went a number of years where we didn't really meet. Um, two times a year, you know, we've had feedback from the town again committee itself, it's just not enough where they feel connected uh, to the MOU and to the process. Um, so a couple considerations as we go forward, did we get the composition right? So right now the president of Acadia sits on it. Um, there's a member of the board of governors that's appointed to it. The president of the ASU and a member um, of the SRC from a student perspective sit on it. The mayor and a member of council sit on it. And then there's a community member that's appointed. Uh, so it's a group of seven and it's supported by staff um, of primarily it's been Acadia and, and Wolfville. Um, ASU sits more as a governor and, and less as a, a support. Um, so Chris and I, or, or Ian and I and Chris have been kind of the, the folks that have supported it um, to date. Um, so a couple questions that come up and I'm just gonna flip to see what's on the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, twice a year, is that enough? Um, we are supposed to be submitting work plans annually to help identify the priorities and inform our own operations plans. And I think this will become even more important to do well if we move away from embedding specific deliverables in the MOU. And to a point earlier, um, how we do a report card that we can present back to all the partners to really show some of the deficiencies and, and celebrate the, the wins is really key. We contemplate all this will happen in the MOU. In practice, it's been difficult to implement. Um, it does flip between being chaired by Acadia and by the town. I think again, COVID played a bit of a monkey wrench with that. Is that the best approach and how do we provide support to that committee so it's consistent whether where the host is the town or whether um, Acadia hosts. So I'm um, just looking for some feedback. I mean, I think I've captured some of the concerns I've heard from the town again committee itself that definitely twice a year is not enough. Um, but thoughts on the composition and, and other suggestions that you might want to see in the new MOU. Okay. Um, I would agree that twice a year is not nearly enough. I think everyone who sat on that committee says it's not nearly enough. You don't even remember what you talked about six months prior to um, it's so infrequent um, and you just get zero momentum. So my question is, so in this MOU as it is now says, we will sit on each other's committees and we will do and da da da. So if we have goals um, and objectives of housing, recreation, infrastructure, whatever, whatever economic development, if there are those four goals and that we have committees that are supporting those, do they feed to the town and gown? So then, then I would say that oversight committee that was listed in this and up there works fine if it doesn't then there's not enough people represented on that for the to encompass all of the areas that we that we would list as goals or plans um so and i'm not sure that everyone who's sitting on the town and gown committee has the level of detail or interest or time to put into those subcommittees so i i don't know how that would work but I just don't see it as enough as it is right now. Council Crawford. Um, on the last slide, Aaron, you referenced you, Ian, and Chris. Those three people are not reflected in the committee makeup. So what role does each play on that committee? If anything, are they in attendance at the meetings? Yeah, so so in the actual MOU, Chris's position and my position were envisioned as being the two support folks to the committee that do the work. Mm -hmm. um, since Ian's been in his position with the Office of the President, he has sort of joined our team kind of uh, by default, we brought him in. So he has been, while not officially named in the MOU, has done a lot of the work in the background. Um, so I would say those are the three staff people that have either done the work or identified um, or contemplate to be the, the people. So whether we're the right people is another question, like who should be supporting this committee, both from the Acadia side and the town side, 
I think is something that we, we need to discuss. Plus, as I mentioned, the ASU doesn't necessarily have somebody sitting there as a staff role. They're there in a governor role. Um, and maybe that's something we need to look at too, is do we have somebody that's kind of working alongside whoever those two reps are from Acadia and the town um, to sort of do the work in between. And I think there's an interesting point that was raised as we go through the MOU, maybe being a little bit more mindful of how we're gonna move forward on some of this. So maybe subcommittees are required for some of the work. Maybe it is at a staff level and that gets reported up and maybe being clear in the MOU around how we're gonna implement it helps make it clear for the town and gown to kind of understand how they'll receive reports and how we might be able to implement this a little more cohesively. Councillor Ingham. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned that Ian attends on behalf of the president's office and Peter, or not, or the president is listed as one of the members. Um, is that going to be problematic? Like if you, uh, you know, have more meetings and I don't know if you're suggesting, you know, four or six, is it just good enough to say office of the president instead of listing the president? If that's so going to be. Does meet. Yeah, but, attend. but you were saying what you were just saying that you were meeting with Chris and Ian more. That's all. I'm just saying, do we have to name like the president or like he can attend or he or she can attend? That's not what I'm saying. But if, if we're if we're meeting more often, would that be hard, harder for somebody in his position? And do we need to say the president, you know, the president or can we have something different? That's, I'm not saying. It's, it's, it's completely up to the partners to decide. The thought behind having the president was because the president should be able to help move those roadblocks, as I mentioned. So if there was a, a concern, that would be the person at Acadia best able to help us resolve it. I think you could always have or designate um, written in so that if we start to meet more frequently and that was an issue, then the president could determine who would best represent him in that case or her, yeah. Um, depending on, yeah. And it, it, like, I don't know who they would, who they would pick to come in their stead, but that could also apply to, you know, any of the partners that there could be a, a designate brought in if we're going to start meeting more frequently and that becomes an issue. Because I could see even with the board of governors representative, depending on where they live and their circumstances, you know, if we meet more frequently, it might be difficult. So that's a, that's a good point. I mean, this then will use up for discussion. So if there's tweaks to that, we can certainly talk to our partners and look to make it so that it works for everybody. Thank you. And Aaron, I think that that's where I've come full circle for the motivation for my question, but can you flip back to the previous screen, please? Yeah, if I can see it. Do it. And this may part of it as well be your concern, Councillor Ingham, question, and I think I know the answer. Those 247 members are voting members, and the three you mentioned are not voting members. So just a point of clarification, because I was curious about that, but my others listening may be as well. And then the second piece of that is I'm really in favor of or designate. Absolutely. Yeah. Not sure where we landed on Councillor McKay's comment about, I think you talked about subcommittees, but you talked about committees and it occurred to me when you said that, that of course we don't actually have working committees, although one could see that that, that might be something to think about um, and, and uh, you know, for example, you could have an economic development committee that was working on economic, um, joint economic initiatives that might have somebody from this, from, from town and gown, but other people who would not be on town and gown, but who might certainly inform economic development or community hard. I mean, uh, not necessarily all of those um, goals will, uh, Find, will require a committee. I can't remember what they all are now, but but potentially some could be working committees and others are are not working committees. It might be just something to put in the parking lot and, and think about. Because certainly that committee, both it's by its composition, uh, as Councillor Proudfoot said, um, and just by sheer numbers could not and, and may not be the appropriate people to do the legwork that might be required in some of those initi initiatives. Councillor McKay? I just feel like the individuals who are listed here do not have the time to dedicate to getting the work done that we feel needs to be done out of this agreement. I think we've all went around the table and said, we've rated our, you, I mean, you've marked it as we, we've failed pretty much every, everything we've 
tried to do was see, well, they not failed, but C and D's, which is not great marks. Um, so if we want to do better, <laughs> then maybe we need to put in some more work. We are. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And when and when I grade at C's and D's, like I, I think there's, like I said, some areas that we've done better than others, and optimistic of the partners that have come to the table that want to work with us. Like I really see sincerity in in the partners wanting to come to the table, and you know, people are here today to listen, and that that speaks volumes. Um, so I'm really hopeful that as we move through this process, we can better identify now that we've had four years under our belts what we need to do better. Um, because those C's and D's can easily become A's and B's as we move forward. We're never going to get perfection, but I think we learn from where we've come from and, and it will be a stronger document. So next steps. So we had reported to Town & Gown back in the spring, a timeline that would have seen us do a workshop with them, but the Town & Gown group in October. We're not going to hit that because over the summer, we were really having a discussion around how do we do a report card that we can sort of use as a starting point because my view on our marks or our grades may not be the same as how Acadia feels or the ASU, we're just one lens. And so we're having this conversation tonight. I think it's really important that Acadia and the ASU have a similar kind of discussion internally around what's worked well, what hasn't, what they'd like to see differently. And we can certainly you know, help facilitate that if required, but. I think it's really key to get the feedback from all three. So then we come together and we have a joint report card around this is how we've done collectively from all the different perspectives. So that will happen. And then identifying the key contact from each party to sort of act as the point of contact, I think is really important. Like we need a little bit of a group and we sort of informally started that, but to, to really roll up our sleeves and make this the priority in the next few months to get this done and to do the work to be able to present back to the town and gown. So there will be a stakeholder engagement plan developed um, and Barb was at that town and gown meeting in, in the spring and she will be helping us with that where we will give an opportunity for folks to weigh in. There was a discussion at town and gown because when the MOU in 2018 was signed, we didn't do broad consultation. It was really limited to the three signatories and the town and gown did say that they would like to see those signatories be engaged obviously but also do some more widespread consultation just to get feedback on what's important um, for us to consider as we move forward so that will happen so there'll be a lot of opportunity for folks to get involved and give feedback and then you know our, our goal is still to try for november to have something together that we can pull the town and gown group together to sort of go through some suggested changes. November might be a little bit optimistic, but it's good to have a goal. You know, if we can get that done before Christmas or the holidays, we'll be in good shape. And then after uh, the holidays and we come back, we'll be in a better position to go back to the different parties and have it ratified through formal means. So that's kind of the goal. Um, and the town and gown ultimately would like them to approve it to recommend to the parties. So we'll be working diligently in the coming months to make that happen. But this was a really good discussion just to give us some feedback on from your perspective, what you'd like to see and we can take that and, and start to move those conversations forward. Also proud for Thank you. And it's a question slash request. I'm not sure how it's gonna come out. Uh, but similarly to how we had um, an open forum here observing this conversation, I wonder, ask, hope that the same would be on the reverse. So when the, when the university and the ASU has this, a similar conversation, if we can all go sit in the audience as well. That we will get an answer tonight, but that is out there for those people who We'll be organizing these. The other, oh, Councillor Elliott. Yeah, um, this is just off the top of my head. Is there room to add further interest areas to the MOU? Um, what I'm thinking of now is the is the huge influx in cars that arrived in town in early September in terms of parking that is infrastructure related for the town to deal with. But there's also an environmental lens that like, what could we be doing better? You know, banning cars might help. I don't know. I just wonder if that's a possibility for further discussion. 
Yeah, so in the what's missing, we can note that that's uh, an area. And I think as we go through these discussions, if we end up with a laundry list of things that we want to include, that's really lengthy and probably not achievable, then we'll probably come back and do like a ranking exercise with the partners to go, okay, what really rises to the top? Um, but I think, you know, we'll throw that into the mix because we are looking for feedback of what's missing. So noted. No other comments? And is that your last slide? That's it, I think. Yeah. Any, any other comments from council? Hearing none, uh, a motion to go in camera. Oh, actually, wait, sorry. We have another public input. Forgot, this was committee at the whole. Do we have anybody else for the second public input? You have three minutes. <laughs> Um, this is at barb height. Okay. All right. I'm not very good at this. I apologize. Yeah, right. just the table. Just a, there's a little latch on the table that moves it down. You can also take the right. I, that, I'll just hold. Okay. I apologize. No. Thank you very much for the opportunity to sit in on this meeting, listen to it, and contribute to it. Um, a couple of points. Listening to the discussion and having read the MOU over several times myself, it feels very much like the MOU describes the relationship between the administration of the town and the Acadia administration with a focus on supporting Acadia students. And it sort of feels like the permanent citizens of Wolfville who do not own businesses are a little bit of an afterthought and the big the permanent citizens do tend to absorb a lot of the behaviors that we have already mentioned we'd like to sort of see better addressed in the MOU. And it just sort of feels like the MOU might need some wording that recognizes the right to a high quality of life of all the citizenry of Wolfville and the responsibility that we all have to hold that. Um, as such, I think one of the goals was uh, we have a joint responsibility to ensure the success of all Acadia students, which should absolutely remain there, but perhaps a friendly amendment to it could include and the high quality of life of all Wolfville civic residents. Um, I would also like to speak to the composition of the town and gown committee. It's not actually the town and gown committee, it's actually the gown and town committee. There's a disproportionate representation on the Acadia side. And perhaps they might consider uh, creating more balanced representation between the town and Acadia in the town and gown committee. And finally, to speak to the point that Councillor Elliott made uh, with regards to cars, cars are a huge issue that residents deal with in residential areas. And I realize that parking and traffic issues are something that the council hears about constantly. Uh, it might be something to consider in a discussion with Acadia around the MOU, but something that Acadia can incorporate into their own policy is create a disincentive for students to bringing cars to campus and to town and perhaps to help generate better infrastructure for biking and walking and events around that and transportation around that. I'm always amazed that there's gotta be parking for somewhere around 200 cars at the athletic center and there is one bike rack it's at the athletic center. It's, it would be very nice to see a disincentive for students to bring cars. This is a walkable town, it's a walkable campus unless you actually have mobility issues. It would be nice to see that capitalized on in the environmental statements that we all make. See if we can support it that way. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. All right. Uh, now we. Yes. You have three minutes. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll try and remember. I had everything in my head, and you know. 
come up here and forget what I'm going to say. Um, but yes, hi everyone. It's so nice to see you folks. I hope you had a, a nice August off of uh, out of session and whatever you kind of call that. Um, I guess just kind of a few like things that resonated with me throughout tonight. Um, I wholeheartedly kind of agree with, um, I, not kind of, I do agree with Councillor Pradfoot's um, you know, statement in regards to EDI and how it's interwoven throughout everything. If there's one thing that I learned from attending um, a, a handful of federal student advocacy conferences um, this summer was that um, truth and reconciliation, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, amongst post-secondary education is not a pillar. It's not standalone. It is uh, interwoven, like you said, Una, in everything that we do and that's the lens that we should be looking in, uh, looking from. So I think from an ASU perspective, um, you know, fostering um, more supportive and uh, empathic relationships um, with students from um, more uh, known minority communities on campus is a goal of mine this year individually. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, you don't always have the support of a team um, who is comfortable pursuing that, but it is a personal goal of mine as president this year. Um, so, you know, there is a potential possibility of bringing some student leaders from different groups on campus um, to be included in town and gown events if we're looking at really increasing diversity and equity and inclusion um, in our meetings because we need those people here to, to hear their voices if that's something um, that's of their capacity and they feel comfortable doing. Um, and then I had something else to say, but I think I've lost my train of thought. Um, in terms of everything else, really happy to be here, obviously. Um, yeah, excited for the conversation to keep going. Um, our orientation week was really successful. Um, we had hundreds of students coming to a few of our events. Um, we've heard nothing but great feedback on the Welcome to Wolfville event um, hosted on Main Street. And we're really happy to see so many students and new students engaged um, on, on Main Street and meeting people. So yeah, um, just a thank you to the town. And I know Kelton and Sienna um, everyone involved kind of, uh, we really appreciate that. And, you know, just hoping to, you know, even continue that throughout the next years. And I think students really appreciate that too. Um, yeah, but I'll leave it there, but thank you. Thank you, Sadie. Cheers. Going once, is there anybody else who would like to speak during public input? Ian? <laughs> All right. Well, I will um, invite council to uh, for a motion to go in camera, say goodbye to the rest of you out here. I don't know if any staff are staying, uh, but they will know who they are. If I have a motion to go in camera, please. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Proudfoot. Thank you, Councillor Ingham. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are in camera. Uh, Mike Long, you can turn 